Good morning, everyone. I'm going to wait a minute here to see this Zoom webinar fill up. All right, I will kick it off. Good morning. On behalf of the Wisconsin Association of Charitable Gift Planners and Madison Community Foundation, I welcome you to the Art and Soul of Nonprofit Development with Don Gray. My name is David Kaler, and I serve each of these organizations as a staff member for the Community Foundation and board member for the Wisconsin Association of Charitable Gift Planners, also known as WACGP. We're excited to have so many people tuned in. I just learned that we had over 150 people registered, which is a record for a WACGP, uh, WACGP program. Our audience includes WACGP members and representatives from nonprofit organizations who hold endowment funds at MCF. We all work to help people make a difference for our world through philanthropy, and it is an honor to have each of you here. Before we are moved by the words of Don Gray, I need to ask you to endure a brief annual member meeting. Uh, like last year, I'm going to offer our barest due diligence on this one. Uh, so for those of you who do not know WACGP, we are a local chapter of a national organization that provides professional development, educational, and networking opportunities for people who work in gift planning. These are development professionals, attorneys, CPAs, wealth managers, philanthropic advisors, and others. We aim to host four programs per year. Membership is only 50 bucks, uh, which during non-COVID times includes some pretty decent coffee. Um, so I call our meeting to order and ask WACGP members to use the Zoom chat feature uh, addressed to everyone to type responses as we entertain several motions. Please type one to move, two to second, Y if you're in favor, N if you're opposed, and if there are any, uh, if there's any discussion, please use the Zoom Q and A feature. So first, uh, I would like to ask for a motion, one and second, two, to approve our minutes from last year's annual meeting. Dave Mostner has the move. Do I have a second? Thank you, Angela Davis. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please type Y. Opposed, N, the minutes are approved. As a brief president's report, uh, we explored some great topics this year, including philanthropy and the LGBTQ community, gifts of real estate and other tangible assets, the ACE Act, and you're gonna love Don Gray. Uh, we canceled our networking social for the second year in a row due to COVID, uh, but we remain optimistic about holding this event in the year ahead. On a positive note, moving online has allowed us to offer our programs at no cost and to reach more people, this morning being a great example of that. Uh, and thanks to our members, including many of you here, our finances are strong. Uh, we hope you will remain or become involved uh, in 2022. We have some great programs in store. So the most important order of business that we have today is electing one fantastic new board member. Martinez White is a man of many talents. He's an author, DJ, public speaker, Emmy award winner, and Badger alum. He currently serves as development director for the United Way of Dane County and brings experience as a financial representative with Northwestern Mutual. He's a bridge between the nonprofit development and professional advisor realms we are so pleased he is offering to share his talent and passion to advance our work in the field of gift planning. May I have a motion to approve the election of nominee Martinez White to our board of directors? That is a one. All right, Courtney Polster uh, makes the motion. May I have a second, please? Dave Mosner is the second. All in favor, please type Y. Any opposed? And the ayes have it. And we have a new board member. I'm thrilled to welcome Martinez to the WACGP board. We'd also like to approve our proposed slate of board officers for next year, which include Bruce Hutler with Baker Tilly as our new president, Colin Nemeth 
with the Wisconsin Foundation and Alumni Association as our new vice president, Dave Mossner with Oakwood Foundation as our new secretary, and Adam Mand with US Bank continuing as treasurer. May I have a motion, one, to approve the election of our officers for 2022. Motion goes to Bridget Frazier. May I have a second, please? Creel Zeering, second. Uh, all in favor, please type Y. Any opposed? N. The motion carries. Uh, before we adjourn this annual meeting, I'd like to recognize Greg Rademacher of Buttonwood Partners, who has completed nine years of board service. Uh, we are a stronger organization today because of Greg's leadership. Thank you, Greg, and best wishes in all that you have ahead. Seeing no questions in the Q&A or chat, I am going to call this meeting adjourned. And I think I beat last year. I'm setting a, a real low bar here for uh, Ferris due diligence. We are so excited to have Don Gray uh, here this morning. Don is retired vice president uh, for the uh, principal gifts for the Wisconsin Foundation and Alumni Association. Uh, where for nearly a quarter century, he worked with some of the country's largest givers and served as vice president for most of the UW's professional schools and colleges. He's a well-known educator and speaker in the development field, dedicating 25 years to leading conferences for CASE and the UW-Madison School of Human Ecology. He's received high recognition for his efforts, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Institute for Charitable Giving I've known Don for most of my career and would be hard pressed to identify someone with more experience, wisdom, and grace. Welcome, Don. Hey, thank you, David. Um, and it's so, so good to be with you. Um, first of all, I want to say how thrilled I am that there are so many of you out there for this program this morning. I'm going to share with you some of the experiences that I have had. You'll find that I am uh, the best way to teach, I've always thought, was to tell your own stories. So I've got a lot of stories to tell you, but they will all, I hope, be relevant to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you, David, for inviting me to do this. And uh, to all of you out there, I know I have many friends listening in, so uh, I'm delighted to have you on this program. Let me tell you a little Don, more if, about... Um, yeah. If I could just remind people before you begin, uh, please... Uh, post your any questions that you have throughout Don's presentation in the uh, Q&A feature, and we will address them uh, as the program elapses. Thank you, Don. So let, let me tell you a little bit about my background and how I came to the place I am today, which is retired. But when I started off, I, I started off right out of my college years when my wife and I, who had just been married about a month before, de decided that we would go into the Peace Corps, and we spent our first two years of marriage in Malawi, Africa. I had never, I had never uh, been overseas in my life. I, I was born and raised in a small town in Ohio, and that really was a life-changing experience for me because both my wife and I decided that what we wanted to do was work on behalf of society for the rest of our lives, do whatever we could to improve the world. And if we were successful, that's all we needed for our thanks. So to have you here today means an awful lot to me. And I'm, I'm hoping that when, by the time we finish the presentation, you will be inspired to look at what you do in slightly different ways with a slightly different vocabulary. Okay, let's start the program. We've got to get the uh, slides up and as soon as they come up, we'll, we'll get started. I've titled the, the talk this morning, The Art and Soul of Nonprofit Development. And many times when you go to seminars for learning how to give, or if you are a person who is a giver, how to make your decisions on where you give, um, I'm trying to make this talk relevant to all of you out there, regardless of what your position is. Let me talk a little bit about the art and soul of nonprofit development. First of all, let's take a look at the what you will see if you go on the internet 
and type in the fundraising process, you will find about 250,000 iterations of this chart. And the chart is a very good one because it shows that first you have to identify, and then if you're in the business, you have to cultivate, and then you have to solicit, and then finally you have to provide good stewardship. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but if you look at these words you'll and, and think about it, you'll find that if you look at those words and see it from your own perspective, they make a lot of sense because that's exactly what you're trying to do. On the other hand, if you use those words out in the community, you're likely to find that they will be somewhat misinterpreted. I think uh, <clears throat> that although it is a very nice chart, there's nothing in here that talks about the feelings that go on when you're doing the process of raising funds or giving the funds away. I saw no art and no soul in this, so I sat down and tried to think to myself, how do we really learn how to relate to people and to do things? And it took me back to a book that was very popular for about two years, and number one on the New York Times bestseller list, called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. This was a book that was written about 32 years ago, 33 years ago. And in it, it talked about the, 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 the author, Robert Fulgham, uh, who is still alive and still, still talking. He listed the things that we should have learned in kindergarten, which would make us better citizens and better people as we go through the years. I read the book because I liked the title and we just gotten back from another one of our tours in the Peace Corps. And I thought, you know, this is really good. This was, believe it or not, my own kindergarten class back in 1946. So you can figure out how old I am now. If you want to know which one I am, I'm the one with his head on the left shoulder of the teacher. I learned very early how to get good grades, I guess. And my best friend is the one in the chair sitting down in the front row. Uh, he was my best friend when I was four years old, and still to this very day, we are the best friends. That's one of the thrills of, of living a long life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but the, the things that were said in that first chapter, the first chapter of this book, were relevant for the rest of your life. And if you read through them, some of them are cute. Some of them really mean a lot. Things like sharing everything, what you're doing is sharing your knowledge about your organization. You need to let people know that. You're kind to people, you don't hit them, you don't hit them up, okay? If you go right down this list, you'll see that you really are learning a good way to live if you learn these things in kindergarten. So I lived with that my entire life and I always had this a little note in my pocket. But now all I need to know about development, however, I didn't learn from Robert Fulgham's book, but rather I learned it from five different individuals who made quotes, random quotes in conversations or at conferences that I might have attended, which gave me the key that I needed to design a process which was going to make some, some sense to what we do and what we are doing and why we are doing it. So let's get right into these five quotes. Quote number one was from my high school English teacher in 19, roughly in the year 1958-1960 in that era. Evelyn Kaufman was a terrific English teacher and every day she would one way or another in our high school English class when I was a senior, she would say, she would always talk for, before she got into any topic area, she would say, remember we are in this class because the words they use are going to define who you are. They will define who you are to others and they will define to yourself. So you need to choose the words very carefully, whether it's in your personal life or whether it's in your professional life. I didn't know how important that was going to be in my professional life until later on, but that was quote number one. Remember that one. By the way, uh, if you're interested in these slides, they are available free of charge. All you have to do is write to uh, uh, David or Liz and they, they will gladly send out this entire presentation to you. Okay, so then let's take a look at this and see if these are the words we want to use when we are talking to people out in the real world. Again, within the confines of our professions, we will use these all the time. 
all of you who work in fundraising and development are familiar with this chart. But look at these words, identification, that's pretty clear. If you had no connection to the nonprofit world in either asking or giving funds away, how would you look at the words of cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship? Well, about 25 years ago, I went into, well, not would have been more recently than that. When I first figured out how to work Google, I went into Google Images and I typed in the word solicitation. And if you look at the word solicitation in Google Images, this is what you're going to see. Almost every combination of words with solicitation have the words no in them. Do it yourself. Go into the word solicitation in Google Images and you will see what I'm saying. Now, when I went in, there were another series of pictures that had almost photographs that had almost the same kind of, uh, of, of numbers in, in the image, but they shut them all out because they thought it was poor taste. I'll let you under, give, give a thought to yourself as to what those images might have been portraying. So why do we use a word in our profession which is predominantly used with a very negative word, no? Okay, so that's all right. That's the way some people will look at it. That brings me to quote number two. If we are going to be working in the nonprofit sector and we want to really understand the importance of the words that we're using, I got a quote from Maya Angelou when I went to a conference that she gave in Madison. It must have been around 19, 1984 or something like that when she was still speaking to a group of educators. At the time, I was the dean of the campus out in Richland Center, Wisconsin, the two -year, lovely two-year campus out there. So Maya Angelou started her, started her presentation. She was talking to educators. I said, what you want to do by through your teaching, and I would say through your work in the nonprofit sector, what you want to do is to compose a good world. This automatically makes what you're doing an honorable and noble profession. Now, sometimes we uh, 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 meet with people and we almost make an excuse for what we're doing and asking for money. Well, we're gonna find out that that's not really what we're doing. You are really wanting to compose a good world through what you can do through your organization to make the world better for a small group or a large group of people or corporations or whatever. It is an honorable and noble profession. So that was the second quote that I, that I designed my en entire philosophy around, that we have to not only be careful of the words that we use, but we have to use them in the context where we are composing a good world, which makes whatever we're doing honorable and noble. This incidentally doesn't just apply to the nonprofit world, it applies to virtually every profession in the world. So let's look at these words again. Here's the standard model for the gift process. And what bothered me when I looked at this after I'd heard some of these quotes was we need a new way of looking at it rather than this, this rather mechanical structure of a cycle which includes those words that are not understood by most people that we'll be working with. So I came up um, after listening to yet another talk where a person used the right terms and I put it together and I decided that really what we're doing in, in, in doing successful development or fundraising work is we are having a mystical mingling of three different ingredients. And these three ingredients are absolutely necessary if we're going to be successful. Number one, we have to have a joyful giver, not a reluctant giver, not somebody who does not want to give but feels forced to do so. We have to have a joyful giver. And we have to have somebody who is truly artful at making an ask, not just going out and as some people would say, hitting others up, that's not what we do, but we try very hard to make an artful ask. And then finally, when the gift is made, we have to make certain that the recipient of the gift feels our gratitude, not just by a, a, a mandatory letter that they can use for their tax files, but rather we have to show them how grateful we are and make them, make, make them understand how personally beneficial that gift has been to other people. So this is what I've been teaching for the last 40 years is the successful development is not just that one trite uh, uh, cycle out there that we see all the time, 
but it's a mystical mingling of a joyful giver, an artful asker, and a grateful recipient. Okay, so the first thing we have to do in our process is to create a joyful giver. And how do we do that? Well, that brings me to quote number three. Some of you know the name John Morgridge. John and Tasha Morgridge are lovely people. They are the largest givers uh, combined to give to the University of Wisconsin. They've now given over half a billion dollars to the university and all the other campuses combined if you, if you put all their gifts together. One of the loveliest couple I've ever met. And I was, re I was uh, uh, given the task of contacting him when, when he was still working with uh, Cisco Systems. Uh, he was well, well before that era but he became the CEO and chairman of Cisco Systems and was the main factor in why are they, they are so important in the uh, computer industry and imaging uh, today. So I was uh, giving John Morgridge a tour of the campus when he came to campus maybe 20 years, 15 or 20 years ago now, and he was already well known to be a very large giver to the university system. <clears throat> and he, John, had just come back from a visit that he had made to another Big Ten university. I won't name that university for obvious reasons. And John told me the story of what happened when he flew, flew in there. He was there to give a talk on, on how Cisco became so, so successful. And he was picked up at the airport uh, from his plane and the, he said it was very nice. They sent a nice car to get him and they, they were going to have a little reception before he gave his talk to the computer science department students. So they drove him to the president's house where a lot of the right people were there to, to greet him. He'd never been on campus before. They greeted him. The president was very kind, came up and president of the, of the university came up and chatted with him for a while. And after a couple of minutes, the, the, the president asked if he would come into his office so they could talk privately. John had never been on campus before, never given any money to them. He just wanted to come and give this talk to the students. So the president got him in his office. And the first thing he did is said, John, you may know or you may not know that we're in a big campaign. And we would be so pleased if you would give us uh, something on the order of $50 million dollars for a new basketball arena. Well, John was furious because he'd never met this man before. He had no, he had no connection with the university. And he said he almost got up, left and went back home, but he knew he had a responsibility for the students. So he gave his talk. Then he went back to his, uh, to his wife and said, we're going straight over to Wisconsin, came to Wisconsin. And I was driving him in from the airport and he told me that story. And after he told me that story, he said, now Don, what you and all of your people who are out there to try to get us to make, make a gift have to understand if you have to, you must earn the right to ask. You can't just ask me for a lot of money. You've got to find out what I'm interested in. You've got to earn the right to ask by showing me what I might be interested in doing. So, why do people give? How do we approach people so that they will give major and ultimate gifts? Here we have two very happy people. And the reason they're happy is that they know that they were, what they give to is because they share the same beliefs, the values and dreams that you have in your organization. If I were you, I would, uh, like I also have myself, I have that made an indelible note to myself is that what we are doing is sharing our beliefs, values, and dreams with others who might have the same beliefs and values. Giving is good. People who give uh, do not give it reluctantly, but they give because it makes them feel good. Number three, they want to have an impact in doing good things for the world. Number four, they like you. Don't ever underestimate the fact that your personality and the way you handle your organization's mission and, and stories is going to be one of the reasons that they give. So we, as the people who are the conduits between the giver and the gift that will be made are very important because they have to like us. They don't wanna be our best friends. 
but they want to feel that they have somebody in the organization that they can trust and call and go to whenever they need to. And finally, it makes them feel good. Giving does not make people feel less wealthy. It makes them feel more wealthy in their minds because of the good things that they have done. So those are the five reasons people give major and gifts. So the first thing we have to do is to create that joyful giver with all these things in mind. When we're creating the joyful giver, obviously we have to make some identification. And you can do this in many different ways. I have found, and I'm sure many of you have found, that one of the best ways to find new people to help you is to talk to people who already are helping you. Use your connections out there with people who have already made commitments or your own staff or the people who are on your board, talk with them about people who have the same kinds of interests that they do and ask if they would give you an introduction. That to me has always been the best way to get to talk to people who might be interested in helping you in your organization. So you have to make an identification, but then you have to make some kind of a connection. Some people would say that this is a, this is a, a, a first contact. Well, I don't necessarily like that, but you have to make a connection. What is the connection that your organization has with that person? And then you have to meet with them and you go into the process of creating the joyful giver. And that's not a one-step process. There are many steps to it. And I'm talking about the people who are capable of giving at relatively large amounts, regardless of what that large amount is for your organization. Because what we have to do is to create the joyful giver. And Carol Bartz is another one of my favorite people and she will give us quote number four. I was out visiting with Carol um, and it was during the era when we had a, a really good chancellor who had a lot of dreams. Uh, some of you will remember the name Donna Shalala. And it was my task to work with Donna and talk to wealthy people and let them know what Donna's uh, uh, top priorities were. So she would give me a list of their, her top priorities. And I went out and took this list to Carol. She at the time was the CEO of Yahoo, uh, now retired. But she, I, I started into my spiel and I started saying, here's what I've got from the chancellor and what we need most. And Carol then got this scowl on her face. She was a lot of fun, you can tell by looking at her. She was a lot of fun and, and I always got along well with her, but she said, oh, Don, stop right there. She said, I don't care what your needs are. Show me how I can make an impact in an, in a, in an area that I actually care about. And that's something that you need to keep in mind. Not, not will the person that you're talking to always want to do what you see as your top priority, but you've got to make that a top priority by finding out if that's something that they actually care about. So when we get to the point, the critical realities that are often overlooked when we're making an ask is that people in an organization sel seldom give because you need the money. They know you need the money. They know every nonprofit organization in the world needs the money. But what you have to do is to understand that people will give at the lower levels because of what you do. That's what you do with your annual fund. You send out your letters. I get a whole bunch of them myself. Some of them are very good, some of them not so good, but they tell about what you do and how you can do to help them. A very good example is the newspapers about this time of the year will oftentimes have a fund that they will ask for small level donations, they get some larger ones, and then they print their names in the paper and that's a really nice thing because people are giving to what you do. But at the higher levels, the reality comes in that at the upper levels of giving, they do not necessarily what you need, but they, they, net, they want to know what you're going to do with the money and why you do it. They give to the what. They, they give to the why you do it, not necessarily what the what. And your why is going to be tied into your values, your beliefs, and your dreams. I'm going to tell you a good story. One of our local, uh, yeah. one of the local nonprofit organizations that I gave a seminar to maybe three or four years ago, um, they are just completing a very successful campaign. 
And uh, well, I, I hope there's I, I hope I don't embarrass anybody out there. But it was the Wisconsin Historical Society, and they were trying to build a new building. As as you know, now it's going to happen in the downtown area. And they asked me to come and talk to their leadership teams about how they best go about raising the funds for that. And I gave the similar spiel that I'm giving to you right now, but in a different way because I was selecting that. When I got to this point, I said, now one of the first stages in a capital campaign is to design your case statement. And I said, okay, if you go to any case statement that you want to, you're going to find that what you're going to find is that people, the people who write that case statement are going to all follow pretty much the same format. They're going to tell you what your, their needs are and ask you to help support one of their needs. Well, let's take a little different approach here. I'm going to ask you to get in groups of five or six, which they did. There were about seven or eight different five or six groupings. And I said, I'm going to give you 10 minutes and I want you to design a paragraph that you're going to put as a preamble to your case statement. And every sentence that you have in that paragraph must start with either we value, we believe, or our dreams are. And I put them to the task and they really got into it. <clears throat> and then I asked when, when the time was up, I asked if they would read to me what they've written. And one group raised their hands immediately and they read it off and I've got a copy of it somewhere, but I don't know where it is, but I've, all, I've got it memorized. It came, it went something like this. We believe that this is what they came up with in 10 minutes as a case statement, an opening paragraph. He said, we believe that every citizen of Wisconsin has a right to understand its own history. We value the fact that our organization is committed to making that dream come, that, that value come true. Our dream is that through a new building, we can provide the information that will lead to people understanding and valuing their state more than they ever have before. And they finished. I said, okay, that can be your case statement. You got it all in there. Then you can talk about all the things you're going to do, but the reason people are going to give was because of that opening statement. You've seen their success. I'm not sure whether they use that paragraph as their opening to their case statement, but I thought it was a, a, a brilliant way to open it up. Universities are particularly uh, guilty of that. They will say, we need scholarships, we need buildings, we need all of these things. <clears throat> but that's not going to do it. You have to share your values, your beliefs, and your dreams. Universities, incidentally, have a very, very large advantage because they have people who are already committed to them because they got an education there. Reality four, people and organizations give to those values, beliefs, and dreams. Okay, so <laughs> creating a joyful giver, I'm sorry, I got a little, little throat problem. Creating a joyful giver, you have to get people's attention, you develop their interest, you talk about things that they might do, that they might enjoy doing, you create a desire for them to do something, and then you take some action. There's a whole lot of information in there, but you've got to be attentive to all of these. It'll take about, for a large gift, it may take anywhere between six months and two years. Sometimes it never happens. But I've had incidences with the mortgages, for example, that they'll give within the first 10 minutes of you make an ask. In other cases, I'll work with people for a year, two years, even longer, and they will eventually do something in many cases, but it will take a long time because it takes a long time for them to really feel as if they are anxious and eager and willing to do something significant. So when we get to the point where it's time to make the ask, we have to make sure that that ask is made artfully. Now, making an artful ask is a skill. Um, it's very hard to do until you've done it and been successful. And I'm gonna give you a, 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 a quick rundown 
of what you need to prepare for when you're making an ask. Always recognize what they've already done, whether it's to attend a performance, whether you've come up with ideas during your prior discussions with them, recognize what they have already done. Thank them for that. Let them know that you are proud of your organization and you let them know because of your posture, how you look when you're, when you're talking with them, your own enthusiasm, how much you share what they're saying and your own passion. You've got to show that. You cannot go into making an ask feeling as if you're nervous and that you're afraid that you will offend people because you won't if you follow this. Restate your why, restate your values, beliefs, and dreams. Don't go right to the point where you say, we're hoping you will give us a million dollars or we're hoping you will give us a thousand dollars. Or if you're just a startup organization, we would just be thrilled if you would give us a hundred dollars. Make sure that you restate who you are and why you're doing what you're doing, what your beliefs, values, and dreams are. I never ask for money. I always ask for consideration of a gift because it's a very different connotation between asking for dollars and asking for people's consideration of a gift. It means roughly the same thing, but it falls on ears in different ways. State a, state a specific amount if the project is clear. If the project is not clear, you can talk a little bit about that, but rely on your instincts and intuition on what the specific amount is that you're going to ask for. You must not be uncomfortable with it. And then you state the specific project and what that impact of that is going to be. And then the final state is uh, the final part of this making an artful ask process is to just, for heaven's sakes, please be quiet. After you make the ask, and if you've done skillfully, it'll go very smoothly, then you just have to sit back and give them a chance to formulate a response. It might be the one you're hoping for. It might be that they'll tell you that, well, that's a very interesting project. I appreciate you asking me, but right now is not a good time. And if that happens, all you can do is say, we understand completely. We'd like to keep in touch with you, perhaps sometime in the future, uh, you'll be in a position to, to consider something else that might make a difference for this organization and the people we, we help. But say, I'd like to stay in touch with you. Would that be all right? And they'll almost always say that would be wonderful because they will, they will feel a little bit embarrassed that they have to say no. Okay, so that's, that, that's what I have to say about to making the ask. Um, if we had enough time, we'd do some role plays, but we can't, that's kind of hard to do on a, on a Zoom conference. Sometimes you'll get a definitive no once you've made the ask, but very seldom. Oftentimes, it's more like a maybe. The timing is wrong, can't, don't, just don't have the funding now. Maybe sometime in the future, I'd like to stay in touch. And if they do that, you got you got to follow the process, keep meeting with them, don't forget about them, keep in contact. But if the best solution is that they say, yes, they would love to do it, and how would you best like them to send the money or work with your financial people, they say yes, then what you have to do is to acknowledge it. You have to do what everybody does, send out the required acknowledgement. It's all gifts should be required to be acknowledged. They must be legally uh, if they're above a certain amount. So be sure that you obey the law there, but that doesn't do it. Then you have to really show how grateful you are. And that brings me to my final quote from Jim Calloway, former Texas oil executive. Um, I was doing some consulting out at a community college system in Colorado. Jim Calloway was not from Colorado, but he'd retired there, former Texas oil executive. And he and his wife had become active on the board of the, of the organization that I was representing, the Colorado uh, colleges in the mountains, so, which were really lovely to visit, but Jim Calloway was one of their largest givers. And so I wanted to meet with him and find out why he gave. And he was taking me on a, on a, 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 on a, on a tour through his 
ranch out there where he had a lot of animals because he was a real animal lover. Jim had given about a million dollars to the veteran vet, vet program at the community college because they had a nice uh, uh, veterinary clinic training program there. And Jim said that his million dollars was just making him just happy as he could be because he, every time he showed up at that clinic, they would welcome him. They would take him around, let him pet the horses and play with the doggies. He just loved it. And then his wife had given a gift for a new uh, arts arena. And he found out when it was completed that they had used half of it for administrative purposes and half of it as an art and he said his wife was upset because she wanted the entire building to be, and she was not enjoying her gift as well as he was enjoying his gift. They'd given a tow, they'd given $1 million to each project. And then Jim turned to me and he said, you know, Don, what you should do whenever you talk with people is let them know that once a gift is made, and he had this thick Texan accent, the giver has the right to enjoy the giving. That's the key of to what we oftentimes call stewardship. We have to make sure that the giver enjoys what they have done. They gave because they loved to do it. They gave because they thought it would improve the world. And the more you can do with your major givers to make sure they enjoy the giving, the more likely you are to have a friend for life. And in almost all cases, you will, not, you will not have any problem uh, approaching them in the future for additional gifts. The mortgages are a good example. They've been treated extremely well by the University of Wisconsin, all the University of Wisconsin system campuses they've given to, and their initial gift to the university was $10 that they started giving annually shortly after they graduated from the university. When we first contacted them, they had given a $500 gift, which back in the early 1980s was a fairly nice gift. So we went out and con con contacted them. Shortly thereafter, they gave a million dollars for the School of Business because John was a School of Business graduate. Since that time, because of the way the university has handled uh, the mortgage family, they have gone up from $100. I've got a chart somewhere, but, but it's, uh, it's a little complicated. They've gone up from the $10 to $500 to a million dollars to $10 million to $50 million to $150 million and then $300 million. That's the way it can work if you make sure the giver enjoys the giving. So that's the best thing I can tell you about that. So you have to show gratitude. And if you show that gratitude, if you show that gratitude, you do it by using, by, by, by looking at a three-legged stool. That three-legged stool is number one, stewardship. That is a good word, by the way. What does stewardship mean? Stewardship means that you let the people know how their money has been spent. That's good stewardship. There's nothing wrong with that word. I use it all the time. You have to be a good steward, but that's not enough. You have to show the impact of the gift. You have to show what good that gift has done. Stewardship has more to do with how the dollars have been spent. Impact is what the good that the impact, what good that that has done for an organization. And then you need to be creative. Be as creative as you can. And the larger the gift, the more creative you want to be. I'll tell one story on this one because it's a really good one. We have another, uh, we had another alum who was an all-American basketball player back in the, believe it or not, the 1950s. Uh, his name was Ab Nicholas, a wonderful man, got to know him well. And he was another one of these major givers. He was also on the UW System Board of Regents at the time. So when I talked with him about making a gift, I knew that he had a lot of interest all over the campus and all over the uh, um, all the campuses of the UW system because the Board of Regents, of course, wrote, runs the entire 26 campuses on the uh, on the Wisconsin map. So Ab wanted to do something that would benefit everybody, and he decided that what he would do was to give a large endowment for 
scholarships to students who were graduates after their two-year programs at one of the two-year campuses and went on to become business school, school students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So he had that connection with the system, with his, with his uh, area of, of, of study at the business school. And we wanted to come up with a, a way to thank him in a way that he would never forget. So what we did is we told him that we were going to have a, a gathering of, of, of folks to, to see him before a basketball game. They have a room, a very nice room called the Nicholas Room because he gave it to that basketball arena also. And we we're going to have it there. And we'd love to have him join us so he could meet some of the people that were responsible for making that project real. And we said, there will be some other guests there too, but we would love to have you attend. Well, he didn't know that that was going to be just, an, uh, just a program for him. But when he said he and his wife would love to be there because they were coming to the basketball game anyway, then we planned it. And I was working at the time with a young woman, she may even be on this call, I'm not sure, to came up with this idea. Why don't we not only have it at the, at the, at, at the Nicholas Room, but why don't we invite all of those two-year students? Why don't we invite all those two-year students who are now at the university on his scholarships to come and meet him? And why don't we present him not with a plaque, but with a basketball, which will have the signatures of all of those students. So the evening arrived and we had a full house. We had basketball coaches there. And then we started introducing Ab to all of these students that were benefiting from his scholarships. And then one of them who had been pre-chosen gave him this basketball with all their names on it and this was a very, very successful businessman. He was in tears of joy to see all that he had done in one room by people who were benefiting from the gift that he had given. That's what we mean about being creative and giving thank you. Now, you don't have to be that elegant. It can just simply be a random note, a random note. I can tell you one other really quick story. My wife and I graduated from a small college in, in Ohio called Mount Union. We love it because that's where we met and we got married right afterwards and went to the Peace Corps. So we've always been generous to them, as generous as we can be. And we recently got a new college president there. His name was Tom. And I read in his bio, because I always go in and read bios when I find somebody's got a new job, and I discovered that he was born and raised in Stowe, Ohio, which is exactly where I was born and raised, a small suburb of Akron, Ohio. And so I sent him a quick email to the president's office. I didn't know what his personal email was. I just said, I understand that we both went to Stowe High School. I'm thrilled to have a Stowe graduate in charge of my campus. And I thought, well, that, I hope he reads that and I hope he enjoys it. Well, believe it or not, I, I sent it to his email, to his president's email. The next day after I sent that, my phone rings and it's him. He's calling to say, thank you for the note. And where did I live in Stowe? And it turns out that I lived two streets across, uh, two streets away from he did, but he was quite a bit younger than I was. But we did have some similar teachers. Now you tell me, do you think we have any indication that we will ever quit giving to that university? No, why? Because he took the time to make a 10 minute call which actually lasted for about an hour. And we were so moved by that, that it even deepened our commitment to that institution more than it ever had before. So understand that the giver will, the giver has to enjoy the giving. Okay. So you must show that you are managed the gift money well, that's the stewardship part, but you also have to make sure that you make, you make them understand the impact of your gift and you must be creative in saying thank you. Okay, well, let's see, that brings us to the final part of the cycle because it's a cycle because if you do show that kind of creativity, 
then what you'll notice that you will be additional interest and that additional interest will go right back and the cycle starts again and it becomes more of a spiral and each time the cycle if the cycle is to represent the amount that you get for your projects you would find that this spike that this cycle becomes larger and larger every time so i urge you um, to get copies of this presentation um, when I used to do the conference for Madison, and I know some of you went to that conference, um, I would impress upon them that if they wanted to really make me happy, understand that it is a mystical mingling of a joyful giver, an artful asker, and a grateful recipient, as opposed to this, because in the case of the mystical mingling, you will find givers will be extremely happy. The other way, it's kind of a business model, and we are not so much in the business of raising funds, we are in the business of composing a good world. So what I'd like you to remember are three different slides. One is these quotes. I want you to understand the importance of composing a good world that you're doing, how honorable and noble it is what you're doing. Number two from Mrs. Kaufman, your words define who you are and to others, choose them carefully. John, John and Tasha Morgridge, you must earn the right to ask. Good old Carol Bartz, I don't care what your needs are, show how I can make an impact in an area I actually care about. And good old Jim, the giver has the right to enjoy the giving. Um, I would urge you to make a copy of this, put it up on your desk or whatever, and refer to it every day. And this cycle, think about this in terms of how we do our business not in terms of identification, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship. It'll make you feel better about what you're doing, and I'll guarantee you, you will have as much or much more success. Okay. Um, we, have a, we have a couple of minutes left, and we have a couple of questions from the audience. If you okay, would good. Be willing to entertain them. So the first comes from Creel Ziering who asks, our organization does environmental work, but not the typical on the ground work, such as land preservation. We focus more on advocacy and training, education, et cetera. How might you recommend we show impact to our donors when they are supporting uh, something that isn't tangible? Okay, you know, you that, that's not that, um, that, that different from working in, a higher edu in an educational system. Because what you are doing is training people who will go into the work that'll change the world. And we all know that professions have to have people who are knowledgeable. They have to have people who are teaching other people because that's the way we expand our effect. And what they're doing because they are in that training program, they are doing exactly that. They are making the foundation for success in the environmental areas because of the good that their students will do once they get out and working in that workforce. So that's what I would, that's what I would start. We believe, I'd say, so for example, my case statement would, we believe that to have a good environment requires that we have people willing to train other people on the necessity of having a good environment. And then you go right on from there. Excellent. Thank you, Don. My next question comes from Martinez White, our newest board member. Congratulations. He asks, <laughs> he asks, how do you achieve a giving relationship with a donor whose values don't quite align with yours? Well, you have to try to find some values that they do. And if they just don't align with yours, you're probably, as they say, uh, not going to have much success. But you may have a little sliver in your organization that they do agree with because uh, very seldom do we either love an organization or hate an organization. We can love an organization, but those who uh, are, are not that receptive just simply don't know enough about us. So I would search in what you do to find an area that might be of some interest and you can say, we understand that you feel differently about some of the things that we're talking about than we do. But here's a project that you might really be interested in. Great, I have uh, two more here. The next one is from Eric Fleming. 
And Eric would like to uh, get Don's wisdom on the prospecting process and especially what factors or criteria he uses for identifying true prospects. That's a tough one. Um, there, there are several ways you can do it, which are rather mechanical. You can purchase uh, uh, large lists of wealthy people. I've never had much success with that. <clears throat> I, 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 what I've found, and, and this is from experience also, that the best way that I was able to find new people to work with was to get together with people that I'm already working with. So uh, even having small groups get together, whether it's on Zoom, but people who have shown interest in what you're doing, and you say, you can tell these people, we need more of you. Who do you know in your realm of influence that might be interested in doing the kinds of things that you're doing for this organization? And if you're willing, we want to talk with you about it and see if you would like to become involved with me or with us in going out and trying to convince people the good that we're doing, and that's what you can do. So I think that's something that can work. It's not a large scale, but if you have really enthusiastic people, especially if they're on your board, that you think would be good in making contacts, and maybe in the first, John Margridge, again, is a good example. Um, I was trying to get a, 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 a gift from a, a person who was kind of hard to, to, to talk to. So I took John with me one day and we started talking about giving to the campaign. This is a long time ago. And I wasn't thinking, I was thinking we were ready to make an ask yet, but this guy who'd already given $10,000 years ago, he said, you know, Don, I've already given $10,000. And John piped in and say, said, Ned, you have not begun giving yet. That's something I couldn't say, but if you have the right volunteer with you, they can really open some eyes that otherwise we would never have been able to get open. So rely on your friends to help you get into the contacts. Excellent, thank you, Don. These are such wise words. Our final question comes from Courtney Polster and she uh, expresses her thanks and asks if you can say a word about successfully working across generations. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, <clears throat> for a long time, we were talking about, for example, generations in terms of what was gonna happen when the, the boomers retired. Well, they're retired now. And you know, the process is pretty much the same. Not a whole lot has changed, whether you're talking about transfer of wealth or whatever. The important thing for the development people to understand is that if you really understand the differences in the generations, you won't have trouble working with people who are one, two, or even three generations older than you. I'm a silent generationer. I'm, I know I haven't been very silent this morning, but I am from that silent generation. If I get contacted by a millennial, I am thrilled because it brings me back to the days that I was in college. I love to get calls from a union so I can talk about what life is like for them there. And then I send them a nice check. But what, what I, I would urge people to do is not worry about the generational changes, but understand that genera generations can get along. And that's one of the problems with the world right now. So don't, don't say to people, well, you're a millennial, we don't want you going out and doing something with somebody who's an, uh, an elderly, silent one. No, that's not right. We love to work with younger people. So I, I, I think that that's essentially what I, would, what, what I would want to say. In the development world, if you find development people who are capable of relating to people of all generations and understand their different backgrounds, then they will not only be successful, but they will make people very happy. And I, 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 I think, you know, I, I, I think I've met with several of you, I know one of you for sure, um, who's about three generations younger than I am. And every time we get together, I am thrilled because um, she believes in what we're doing. She's carrying on the tradition. And it's, it's, it's just a marvelous thing to see. So don't worry about how either old or how young you are. If you're capable, you can deal with any generation 
just be yourself. Don, thank you so much for sharing your passion and what you've learned over the years through such amazing and memorable stories. Our world is changing very fast and your words are grounding and timeless, so thank you. Well, I wanna thank the, uh, the, the foundation for inviting me. I've enjoyed this immensely. I'm delighted that there are so many of you out there. I wish you all the very best and uh, just, just keep remembering that what you're doing is composing that good world. It is an honorable profession. And thanks to everyone who joined us and for the important work that you and your colleagues advance for our community. We've had a bunch of requests on for your slides and we will send out a link to those and to a full recording of this session, which will be found on the WACGP website, wisconsinplannedgiving.org. Uh, you'll also find soon a list of our upcoming programs for 2022 and information on becoming a member. We'd love to have you. Thank you again and enjoy this beautiful fall day.